Tom, thank you. Please uh, sit. Tommy. I always call, I've been calling Senator Carper Tommy for 40 years. And I call him Tommy in the morning. Who, who are you talking about? <laughs> I'm talking about my buddy, a dear friend, a combat veteran, a guy who serving in the Senate, and he gets it. He gets it. And uh, that's why he's hosted events like this for decades as a U.S. Senator and before that as Congressman. I also want to thank Chris Coons. Let me use this mic if I can. Is this one working? I also want to thank Chris Coons and Congressman Lisa Br Rochester. Thanks for their friendship and their leadership. And John Carney, you're doing a hell of a job, pal. But uh, <laughs> I've only one regret. He used to work for me. He left me became governor. What the hell? I mean. <laughs> And General Barry, uh, thank you for having us today. It means so much uh, to me. For and uh, I must tell you, uh, um, I, I, I ride by this building a lot. Yanning Air Force One to fly back and forth to Washington and wherever I'm going, and uh, it always leaves me a little bit of a lump in my throat. My wife's last warning today, when I, she she's still in Washington, where. There's 1,200 people showing up at the White House uh, beginning noon, and they're going to be a little late. But uh, um, and uh, she said, "Joe, don't get emotional." Not that I ever get emotional, <laughs> but it, it means so much to me, uh, and it meant so much to Bo, Frank Vavilo, Bo's Adjutant General, and a great friend. And I want to thank General Vavilo as well. <laughs> what I want to do. There's a guy here that flew 25 missions, 25 missions in World War II over Germany. First lieutenant, young guy, 102 years old. Ray, and guess what? He lives in Ellesmere. And my claim to fame is, I used to be his county councilman. Ray, thanks for being here, pal. You're the best. You're the best. Thank you. I may be Irish, but I'm not stupid. I married Dominic Giacoppa's daughter, so you know I got a little Italian in me now. You know. The uh, but it is remarkable. Ray flew 25 B-17 bombing runs during World War II. And I might add, one of the Distinguished Flying Cross. <laughs> Ray, you were part of the, uh, was referred to as the greatest generation. But there's no generation in American history more than this present and recently past generation that have been deployed more, have given more than the generation represented by the people we're going to be looking at and honoring today. No, nobody has been in a situation where they show up for their one deployment, then two, and three, and four, and sometimes five and six. One of the last times I flew into Iraq, I went up in the cockpit, and they fire me what's called a silver bullet when it's fire the president, and there's a special container in a plane they stick in. And I went up with a, I went up with a group. And I was telling this to uh, Bo's father-in-law and my grade school friend who's sitting right there, and he's taping it all, but he's going to use it against me here, <laughs> Ronnie Oliver. But, uh, and I said, how many of this your first uh, deployment? Nobody raised their hand. And the, and, the, and the crew was in there as well, the, the flight crew. And I said, how many second deployment? deployment? Nobody raised their hand. Third, three, fourth, two, fifth, four. Doesn't happen very often. And these kids keep getting back up. One percent. One percent of them defends 99 percent of us. One percent. And uh, I think uh, that doesn't take a single thing away from the World War II veterans generation, but I want to tell you, 
it is, uh, it is, it doesn't go noticed enough. How many of you who fought in Iraq and Afghanistan and all through these last wars we've had, how many mothers and wives and sons and daughters sat at that empty birthday, saw that empty chair at the birthday party? And the difference is, a lot of you, my, my generation, on after on December 7th that we celebrated the bravery of all the, on the, those who showed up, on the Finnegan side of the family, four brothers, every single one volunteered the very next day on Monday to join. My uncle, Frank Biden, joined. My father was working in the shipyards. The fact of the matter is that, um, you know, uh, it wasn't a second thought. It just showed up. And it was a generation represented by you, Ray, that uh, doesn't look for uh, accolades. You know, I, uh, my dad, when I got elected vice president, he said, Joey, Uncle Frank fought in the Battle of the Bulge. He was not feeling very well now, but not because of the Battle of the Bulge, but he said, and he won the Purple Heart. And he never received it. He never, he never got it. Do you think you could help him get it? We'll surprise him. So he got him the Purple Heart. He had won it in the Battle of the Bulge. And I remember he came over to the house, and I came out, and he said, present it to him. Okay, we had the family there. I said, Uncle Frank, you won this, and I went to peace. He said, I don't want the damn thing. <laughs> no, I'm serious. He said, I don't want it. I said, what's the matter, Uncle Frank? You earned it. He said, yeah, but the others died. The others died. I lived. I don't want it. So it's like a generation, this generation, in Vietnam, or excuse me, in, uh, uh, in Iraq. I was up on one of the points, and they asked the... The C CO asked me if I would pin on a silver star, because a young man on one of these points had, had one of his f colleagues shot, fell down about, I guess, equivalent. I was, I was out there at the point. And out, it was, uh, I guess, about 150 feet, not straight down, but a hill. And this young man climbed down the hill, put a guy on his shoulder and brought him back up, and was shot on the way up. And he got there, and I went to present it to him, too, and he said, I don't want it. I don't want it. He died. He died. You understand what I'm talking about, don't you? It's real. So these are women and men who are enormously consequential to not only the physical safety of this country, but the character, the character of America. It's who we are. It's who we are. You're the blood, bone, sinew. You're the backbone of America. And you know, uh, we have a, my colleagues have heard me say this for a long, long time. We have a lot of obligations as Americans. But we only have one sacred obligation. Obligations of the old and the young to educate, to take care, but only one sacred obligation. Let's prepare those we send to war and care for them and their families when they come home from war. And I mean that, and I know my colleagues, we mean that from the bottom of our heart. Reason I call Dennis, who's one of the most qualified people I've ever worked with in Washington, and to ask him to become the head up the VA nationally is that um, I was like all of you in the VA over here and get a phone call. My husband, my son, my daughter is really in, in trouble. She's got to come in, got to see her. Well, she'll be able to come in in 10 days, two weeks. More people have died from suicide, suicide, suicide than any other cause in the last three, five years. So I called Dennis and said, can we fix this, pal? That was a start. We increased the federal budget larger than it's ever been increased two years in a row for the VA because we owe it. <laughs> we 
We've reached out to docs, nurses, specialized surgeons to come in to the VA, expand the expertise. There are good people there. They're all good people. But to increase it, and I think we're making progress. I think we're making genuine progress. And you know, uh, um, I think that there's a, I've been in and out, not as uh, obviously combatant, but in and out of Afghanistan, Iraq, and his areas 38, 39 times. As, not as president, only twice as president, but from the time I was a senator, but particularly when I was vice president. And, um, you know, uh, it was pretty clear to a lot, there was a lot of discussion, as some of you remember, about these burn pits. You all know what a burn pit is? It's a hole between eight and 10 feet, to as high as 12 feet deep, the size of a football field, a great big rectangle. And every damn ugly thing in the world is burned in it. Everything, everything. Toxic waste, everything. And I'm no doctor, but it's pretty clear a lot of guys and women getting sick. And so, you know, uh, one of the things is these uh, poisonous chemicals, jet fuel, and some places, some other things I won't mention. The toxic smoke is thick with poison, spreading in the air into the lungs of our troops. And many of them, when they came home, many when they came home, had gone the best trained, fittest warriors in the world and came home with headaches, numbness, dizziness, cancer. Remember Bo Cole and saying he, how I he collapsed on a run? Well, you know, Bo's father-in-law, as I said, Ronnie Oliver, my friend is here. So are several members of the Guard who serve with Bo in Iraq. This is personal to them and it's personal to all of us. And it's not unique to me and my family. So many are here today and around the country. Secretary McDonough can tell you we're determined, we're determined to do something about this, come hell or high water. And I mean that. I made it real clear to the United States Congress, if they didn't pass this damn burn pit bill, I was gonna go on holy war, not a joke. And I want to thank, we have, we have to thank someone for this that helped a great deal, if not here, John Stewart. John Stewart <laughs> made a gigantic difference. And Dennis and others and I went to, on, the, on the Capitol steps with groups, and maybe some of you were part of that. Thank you. And you were there, you stayed there, and you insisted that they vote on it because some of our friends were not willing to do this but you insisted. And finally, finally, you know, they stepped up. It was part of my agenda that I announced in my State of the Union message to rally the country together. Beating, and I, said, they, I mentioned four things. I said, number one, I thought, I tried to find things that everyone could agree on in a nonpartisan way that were critical. One was dealing with the opioid epidemic in America. Two was tackling the mental health crisis, which is real in America. Three was ending cancer as we know it because we're making significant progress and investing billions of dollars now to find cures. And thirdly was support our veterans because the need was great and the number was in the billions. Well, I delivered that speech in March in August of this year, the Bipartisan Pact Act was on my desk to sign the law. And it's one of the most significant laws in our history to help millions of veterans who are exposed to toxic substances during the military service. And you know, and it got done because veterans and families, some of the families here rallied the nation, rallied the country to get it done. After I signed the bill, some of you may have seen the picture because we played on television a lot. I handed the pen over to the widow of the child, Sergeant First Class Heath Robinson, a beautiful little girl. Usually you hand the pen you sign with to the lead sponsor of the bill. And I handed it to her, and she held it and looked at it. She gave me a kiss and said, thank you for my daddy. 
Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, this is a, a family suffered a great loss, but turned their pain into purpose. So other families wouldn't have to experience the same thing. And that's courage. That's character, in my view. And that's who we are. That's what defines us. We're the most unique nation in the history of the world because we're the only one that's a product of an idea, not geography, not religion, not ethnicity, an idea. We, the people, hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men and women, we've never fully lived up to it, we've never walked away from it. And the people who's protected are the most of you people sitting in front of me. You know, <coughs> we learned a horrible lesson after Vietnam how the harmful expect, uh, effects of a Agent Orange. And a, a new generation, understandably, doesn't focus on that very much. But you know the biggest problem with Agent Orange? It dropped on a hell of a lot of people's heads. They got all kinds of illnesses, but they couldn't prove it. You had to be able to prove it. You had to have the scientific background to be able to dig in and prove it. Well, because of Tommy and because of others in the, we're serving with at the time, we insisted that you don't, if you, all you have to do is prove you were impacted by, it landed on your head, figuratively. No, I'm serious. Nothing else to prove. Nothing else to prove. Because why should the burden be on the victim to demonstrate the problems they've suffered since then? And because of that, Agent Orange, when other people weren't suffering those things. So folks, <clears throat> That's why you heard me say earlier that, you know, when Tom and I supported the Agent Orange Act, that was hard to believe, Tommy. That's 1991. You're getting old, man. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> Supporting veterans exposed to harmful substances like we saw in Vietnam. Now the PACT Act brings us one closer to fulfilling that sacred obligation. It empowers the VA to move more quickly to determine if a veteran qualifies for the benefits of the law. And the benefits are real. They're real benefits, like exposure screenings. If you came back and you are uh, and not in a bag, but in a, uh, walking, you came back, you're exposed, you get the screening. It means new facilities, new research, more health care workers at VA hospitals. And for families who suffer the ultimate loss, it means potential access to life insurance, tuition benefits, home loan assistance, monthly stipends. And it's real. It's not small. It's what we should be doing. It says that, for example, if you're a spouse of a surviving veteran who died, or a veteran who died from a toxic illness with two children, you could be eligible for $2,000 a month to help with those children. It'll never make up for the price, the piece of the soul you lost but it is important, those kids. I was talking to someone a little bit earlier without naming them, and uh, you know, there's tuition benefits. If in fact you go to a state university, your child, the child of someone who's died, then you get free state tuition. If you go to a private university, you get up to $26,000 a year. It matters. You qualify for VA home loans. You've, and, and just the bottom line is, you all know it, many of you know it, many of you are victims of it. When you lose one of the breadwinners, it leaves a gigantic hole. And when that hole is left because they served all of us, we deserve, they deserve to have it filled or try to fill it. So passing the, PAS Act, the PACT Act was the first step of being, making sure that we leave no one behind. We also need to pass the bipartisan government funding bill so we can deliver on the law's promise. There's a little bit of a, anyway, you hear in the press. <laughs> I wanted to come here today, but I gotta go back quickly today to sign a few pieces of legislation. But during this PAC Act week of action, to spread the word that every veteran our surviving family member knows how access to these benefits are made possible. The law, and because of these conditions, have already taken such a toll on so many veterans. I have directed the Department of Veterans Affairs to treat all 23, all 23 of the presumptive conditions in this law as applicable immediately. 
I'm urging all veterans of these decades of war to enroll in the VA health care to get screening for toxic exposure and to promptly file your claim. And for those who may be watching at home because the press is here, visit va.gov slash pact, P-A-C-T, va.gov slash pact, P-A-C-T. And like you heard from Secretary McDonough, the VA will move as quickly as possible to resolve your claim and to get you the benefits you've earned. Here at the Bo Biden National Guard Reserve Center, where Jill and I stopped to say goodbye to Delaware as we were about to be sworn in in Washington, D.C. to take our oath of office, is an appropriate place from my perspective and Jill's to be able to continue to push for implementation of this PACT Act. And there's no place, there's no place I'd rather be today to get the message out about the PACT Act than home here and here in this particular facility. God bless you all, and may God protect our troops. Thank you. Thank you. And if you hear a plane flying over this facility, it's me and Air Force One. <laughs> I've got to go down. I've got to sign the first piece of legislation that just got passed. I was supposed to do that about 2 o'clock. And, uh, and anybody who wants to come to Washington, me, jump on. We're going <laughs> Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank all of you. Appreciate it. Thank you. <laughs>